if you do unit conversions in science class, you might be better off using the one degree equals two pi over 360, or the one radian equals 180 degrees over pi, depending on how you like to do your conversions. So I like to start up at 360 equals two pi, and then multiply or divide that to get what I want. And we'll do 120 degrees to radians. So we'll start with 360. And I need to turn this into 120, so we'll multiply by one third. We get two thirds pi or two pi over three. And we'll do one more conversion. And we'll start with the same 360 degrees equals two pi. And I need to, I could multiply by negative 3 fourths, but because of that 2, I really need to multiply by negative 3 eighths. So it turns into negative 3 fourths. And 360 divided by 8 is something. We'll just factor it two out. So we got 45 degrees. And now we have six trig functions and we're gonna write out their definitions and I'm going to write both the uh, unit circle version and the Sogatoa version at the same time. So they're all based on a circle. So there's our circle has a radius, also known as the hypotenuse, it, when we draw a triangle. We connect our triangle up. We have a right triangle. This point right here has coordinates x, y, and you can think of the x and the y coordinates as measures of side length. So we'll start out with cosine, and of course we're measuring angle theta, and theta is always measured from the positive x-axis counterclockwise, so from the right rotating sort of up to the left. So cos theta is just x over r. And if we go with, uh, so y is the opposite, and x is the adjacent. When we write opposite and adjacent, we mean with respect to where we put theta. So we put theta in the bottom left. So we got opposite side, adjacent side. The reason the hypotenuse is sort of the adjacent side, but it is a special side. It's opposite the right triangle, the right angle in the triangle, so we call it the hypotenuse to distinguish it from the regular adjacent side. So cosine adjacent over hypotenuse. Sine is y over r. 
And actually I'm going to, when r equals one, you don't need to write the r anymore because x divided by one is just x. So cosine is just x when r equals one. And when r equals 1, sine is just y, tangent is y over x, which is opposite over adjacent. And there is no r in there at all, so when r is 1, nothing changes on tangent. It's just y over x. So these are the regular trig functions, and now the reciprocals. We'll write them in the corresponding order. So the reciprocal of cosine is secant. So it's r over x, hypotenuse over adjacent. And when r is 1, you have 1 over x. Now the reciprocal of sine is cosecant. r over y, hypotenuse over opposite. And when r is 1, that's 1 over y. And last up, reciprocal of tangent is cotangent. x over y, hypotenuse over, no. That is adjacent over opposite. There's the six trig functions. And you're not going to get any cheat sheet in calculus class. So you have to remember everything. Most of those uh, obscure trig uh, identities that we derived, you won't need most of those. So you don't need to worry about most of those uh, obscure ones that had squares and uh, plus, minus, and all that. There's plenty of things you do have to remember from trig class, but the more obscure ones that I put on the cheat sheet in uh, pre-calculus 2, you don't need, I think, anything on that cheat sheet. Now, you will have to know trig values. So we'll go through the first quadrant for trig values. There's our pi over 4, pi over 6, and pi over 3. Now I put a little extra mark on the, that would be pi over 12 and 5 pi over 12 because of the way that these are all spaced out. So we have 0 right here, pi over 3, pi over 6 pi over 4, pi over 3, and 90 degrees or right angle is pi over 2. And we'll fill in the easy points, the first and last point, 1, 0, and 0, 1. And this is on a unit circle. So we have three other points that we need to know the coordinates for. These can be a little tricky to memorize. So if you came right from trigonometry class last quarter, this is probably not hard to memorize. It may have not faded yet from your mind. If it's been longer than last quarter, or if you have trouble remembering them, the first thing notice there's a pattern happening. And 
if you go one direction, 0, 1 half, 1 over square root 2, square root 3 over 2, 1. It increases from 0 to 1. And go the other direction from 0 to 1, so I'm looking at the y coordinates, 0, 1 half, 1 over square root 2, three, square root 3 over 2, 1. So they're the same numbers put in the opposite order. So if we re remember one of the sequences, we'll just reverse it. And the first and last points are easy, 0, 1, 1, 0. Those are very easy to figure out what they are. So we just have to figure out how do we remember the numbers in between. So we're going to look at square root of fourths, zero fourths, one fourth, two fourths, three fourths, four fourths, and then reduce them. Square root zero fourths is zero. Square root one fourth, that is one half. Square root two fourths, we could reduce it to square root one half, or one over square root two. And square root 3 fourths, square root 3 over 2, square root 4 fourths is 1. So there we go, the five numbers, they do have a pattern, it's just not the obvious pattern. Square rooted from 0 fourths to 4 fourths, and reduce them. You probably don't need to write this out maybe three or four times, and then you'll have it memorized. It's a reasonable thing on your quiz to just redraw the first quadrant of the unit circle, put the numbers in. That's the first thing you do. You won't need to trig every quiz, but probably about 30, about 30% 30 of your quizzes you'll need trig, approximately. So it'll be a decent amount of trig. It's mostly gonna be values and knowing uh, the functions. Oh, and of course, x on the unit circle. x is cos theta and y is sine theta. So we're writing cos theta values as the 5x values we wrote and sine theta values the 5y values that we wrote. And the unit circle has four quadrants. All we did was quadrant one. So let's figure out some trig values in other quadrants. And we're going to use reference angles for this. So we'll start with uh, a given angle theta. The reference angle we use theta bar for the reference angle. So the reference angle theta bar is the smallest positive angle back to the x-axis. So it is probably most useful to have a geometric intuition for this. So I'll draw the four possibilities for where your reference angle could be. So it's a little bit lame if your angle is in quadrant one and you're already positive. Your reference angle is your angle itself right there. So it's kind of boring in quadrant one. I'll go in blue for the reference angle. Theta is theta bar in quadrant one. Things are more interesting in the other quadrants. So if we're in quadrant two, there's theta theta bar is definitely not theta. There's a much shorter angle to the x-axis. So that angle 
And in blue, theta bar is our angle in quadrant two. How are theta and theta bar related? What equation can I make that has theta and theta bar in it? What is theta plus theta bar equal? Pi. So right here, it's, this is the intuitive equation. And then you can subtract. If you want to solve for theta bar, you get pi minus theta. Now we'll do a quadrant three. Somewhere down here. We'll label theta up here. So theta bar, this is not the shortest positive angle. That's the shortest positive angle right there. And remember, positive is not where it starts from, but what direction that it rotates in. So as long as we have counterclockwise, we're drawing positive angles. So it doesn't matter that theta bar is in quadrant three. Theta bar is a positive angle because it's rotating counterclockwise. So these two, if I want to relate them, what's an equation to relate theta and theta bar together? It's not the same as last as a quadrant two. So we could write it as theta bar equals theta minus pi. All right, yeah, theta minus pi. Uh, if we avoid subtraction, theta equals pi plus theta bar. So if we keep everything rotating the regular way, I can write that theta, the big angle theta is go halfway around and then go theta bar. Last up, quadrant four. So there's our theta measurement. Theta bar is this little angle right there. And what do I get if I add theta plus theta bar? So I get a full rotation, which is 2 pi. So solve for theta bar, 2 pi minus theta. <coughs> because there's a, well, I could write the first equation down, but it's not very exciting. Because there's different equations depending on what quadrant you're in, it's not generally good to memorize the equations. It's better to just figure out what quadrant are you in, and then use your intuition and figure out what's the smallest positive uh, angle back to the x-axis. So geometric intuition is much more useful here. And now we're going to do some examples. Oh, so why do we care about reference angles? I should tell you that first. Reference angles and trig functions. I'm going to let t be any trig function. So the equation we get, the relationship is that a trig function of theta is always going to be a trig function of the reference angle, except it might be negative. So your trig function is of theta is equal to the trig function of reference angle but you may have to make it negative. And the plus minus really just depends on the trig function and the quadrant you're in. And that determines positive or negative. So it depends on the quadrant of theta and which trig function.
So which trig function is important? <coughs> because some trig functions use x, some use y, and some use both. And you just have to know what quadrant are you in. Is x positive or negative? Is y positive or negative? And then you'll know if your trig function is positive or negative. So we'll go sine. So what is sine 5 pi over 6? So 5 pi over 6, <coughs> we have to figure out what quadrant is that in. Normally, we count over here all the way to the right as pi. But fractions suck unless you do what? They have common denominator. So fractions are only really bad if you don't have common denominators. So we see we're working in 6. So this will be 6 pi over 6. So that's halfway around our circle. Now it's pretty easy to see where 5 pi over 6 is. Not because we're geniuses at fractions, but because we have common denominators. So cut this into 6 pieces. We're going 5 of those 6. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So there is 5 pi over 6. I'll switch to the blue marker. I didn't leave myself very much room to write theta down here, so I'll try to squeeze that in, or a theta bar, I should say. There's our little theta bar. So just from this picture right here, what does what value does theta bar have? Six. So you go 5, 6, and the other 1, 6, you got 6, 6. So you got pi over 6. So if you want to feel like a genius at fractions, not hard, just go common denominator. And everything will generally work out as long as you convert it correctly. For example, if I did maybe 12 pi over 6, this wouldn't work out so well. But as long as you convert correctly, things should work out. All right, so we know sine five, pi, sine 5 pi over 6, according to what we wrote right above, equals plus or minus sine theta bar. And theta bar is pi over 6. So we can run right above and see what was sine pi over 6. And our sine pi over 6 is, here's pi over 6. Whoa. There's an angle pi over 6. Sine is the y value. So we're going with the 1 half right there. Now I have to make a choice, one half positive or one half negative. So now you have to know sine is measuring the y value, not the x value. So is y positive or negative in quadrant two? So our y is positive and our x becomes negative. So we're going with the positive. So we'll go ahead and erase the plus minus. We have positive one half. If you want to, you can label the point. We got one half as the y. The x would be negative square root 3 over 2. So the x coordinate from our original, which I'll write in blue. This is more information than you need to write down. You don't need to label the, especially the x coordinate. It wasn't particularly relevant, but just writing everything down so you see where it comes from. So our x coordinate changes to negative, but our y coordinate stays the same. The other possible angles that have the same reference angle would be these right here. They'd have the same square root 3 over 2, 1 half, but they'd just be positive or negative, depending on which of the four angles we'd be using. Thing. Find let's do cos negative eleven pi over three. So negative eleven pi over three. 
So that's negative. We're going to spin counterclockwise. We're going to go down to the left instead of up to the left. We also have to count in thirds. The other problem is 11 pi over 3 is a pretty big number. So we're going to do more than one full rotation the wrong way. So let's get started and see. I'm going to draw a slightly larger unit circle because my angle is going to kind of spiral a little bit. I need to do more than one full lap. So this is 0. Also, we could call it 2 pi. But if we count in negative thirds, so negative 2 pi, it'll be negative 6 pi over 3. The next time that we get back here, so when I say negative 2 pi, if we go one full lap and we're going this direction, the wrong way, that's negative 2 pi. So that's negative 1 rotation. Negative 2 pi is negative 6 pi over 3. That's not nearly enough. I need to keep going. So the next time we make it all the way around, we'll have negative 4 pi, which is negative 12 pi over 3. And that is very close to the angle we actually want. So we're going to go negative 11 pi over 3. So if we st stop here temporarily, we ha had negative pi, which was negative 3 pi over 3. The next stop, we negative 3 pi, which is negative 9 pi over 3. And you can see from here, we need to go another 3 pi over 3 more. So I'm going to do my best to cut the angle from negative 3 pi to negative 4 pi in three pieces. So it's going to be about like that. So I'm just cutting up into thirds. And there is two thirds of them. Questions on that. So we did a full negative uh, rotation and then an almost another negative rotation. We just stopped a tiny bit short of the full uh, 12 pi over 3. So why wouldn't it stop right here? Yeah. Uh, that would be another. So if we. Whoa. That, so if we did this right here, that angle would be a pi over 6, and I think the full, the full angle would be oops, not negative 9, negative 11 pi over 3 minus pi over 6, which I think would be negative 23, be negative 23 pi over 6. It's a little strange because we cut this piece into thirds right there, not this, just that part. So the problem is the circle's already cut into four pieces, and we took the upper two pieces and cut those into three thirds. Uh, but the, the short answer to that question, why is it not 6? Because if it was going to be a 6, we would have seen a 6 show up in our denominator originally. So the fact that it started out in thirds meant that no matter what, my angle, my reference angle would be in thirds. Yeah, our last one I think was in 6, so no matter what, you would expect your reference angle to have the same denominator your original had. That's about all they really share in common numerically. Like the geometry is how they really fit together. Well, it would work if we let reference angles be negative. But we always measure the positive angle. So we're about to finally draw the reference angle in. So this is not the correct reference angle. What's wrong? With it's almost the right size, but what's wrong with this one? It's a negative one. So it's 
the right magnitude, but the right angle goes right there, the other way. So there's our theta bar. I could write an equation relating theta and theta bar. Looks like if I subtracted them carefully, I might get negative 4 pi, something like that. But I'm not going to worry about that. Let's just use intuition to measure theta bar. So the whole point of common denominators, we see over here is negative 12 pi over 3. And we saw theta was negative 11 pi over 3. Those are the two important things we need up here. We spent a lot of time making everything else accurate. But these are the two numbers we need to focus on. How do I figure out theta bar from these two? So it's going to be just pi over 3. It's how much is left over between these two. So we go negative 11 pi over 3, and then negative 12 pi over 3 is the finish. So we just have to go pi over 3 more to get there. If we want to set up the actual equation, it would be, let's see, if, if you go all the way to 4 pi plus theta bar equals theta. So go all the way to 4 pi, or I should say negative 4 pi. So spin the wrong way two rotations, come back theta bar, and you'll have theta. So there's the equation written out with addition. You could, of course, subtract or theta bar equals theta plus 4 pi. So the whole reason we did this, so we can write cos negative 11 pi over 3 equals plus or minus cos theta bar. So you do have to know what is cosine pi over 3. And that will be up on our unit circle that we drew earlier. Pi over 3 angle cosines the x. So we're going with that 1 half the x value there. We also have to choose plus or minus. What quadrant is our angle actually in? First quadrant. First quadrant's nice. Everybody's positive. So we're going with positive one half. The same answer we got last time? Yeah, that was just coincidence. Because we did more than one complete rotation, there is a much easier way to do this. What property of cosine could I have used, especially if it was ne maybe negative 111 pi over 3? That would have been a whole big pain to write some huge spiral spinning around lots and lots of times. What other property could I have used because this angle was bigger than one rotation? Give you a hint, it's got 2 pi in it. That's part of it. That was one of the consequences of it. So we have periodic properties. So periodic properties, what they look like. If you can take your function, if you add p to the input, and you get the same output, your function is periodic. 
and we generally only want to talk about positive periods. It turns out your period, if your period was negative, it works just the same, but usually we just talk about periods being positive. And you don't want to have a zero period because that's a pretty useless statement right there. What's x plus zero? Yeah, so this one's always true. So that's why you don't want to let p equal zero, or you get something pretty useless. If you're a graph person, what does this uh, plus p do? We saw that yesterday. What would plus p do to the graph? Shift it to the, if p is positive, which way would it shift it? It would shift it to the left. So this says, it, the graph, if you shift to the left, however much p is, you'll get the exact same graph. It's the same function. So graphically, it means there's a pattern that repeats every p distance. So we'll just write down all the trig function periods. So most of the periods are 2 pi. So most of the functions are covered with a 2 pi period. Cosine, and sine, and secant. And what is the other period that some trig functions have? Regular pi, and that is the tangent. And cotangent. So there's a two different periods trig functions can have. If you're just guessing, two pi is a better guess because you're four, six chance of getting it right. So most trig functions have two pi as their period, except the tangent cotangents. So that was periodic. And another property of periodic what happens if we add two periods in here? X plus 2p. We could write that as x plus p plus p. And if we regroup this way, I can use a periodic property and say, oh, that adding that last p doesn't change the output of our function. So this is f of just x plus p, and use the periodic property a second time, and we have just f of x. So you can add two periods in there. If I do the same thing three times in a row, I get three periods, four periods, five periods. I think we used the letter K before. So this will work for any integer K. And did I write down the integers? I think the first day of class, you wrote down integers before. So it's all the whole uh, positive and negative whole numbers. I'll write down one more time. Now I didn't actually show this for the negative values at all, but we'll just do it for uh, f of x minus p So I'm using the periodic property in reverse. I'm going to begin with f of x minus p, and if f is periodic, I can add a p to the input. So I just added a p to it, and it's not going to change. And of course, algebraically, those two p's cancel out. Minus p plus p, which is just 
f of x. So you can get rid of the negative ones by just adding a bunch of p's in there. Even if it was x minus 100p, I'll just add 100p into there. I won't change it. So there's the full periodic property right there written out. But all you really need is that one. It implies all the rest. Now even odd are the two properties you're going to do next. So even functions, if you input negative x, it does not change the output. It corresponds to y axis symmetry. And which functions are even? Cosine. So cosine is one of the only even functions. Cosine and the reciprocal, which is secant. So cosine, secant, or even. And I'll write these, well, we've already started with x's. We'll stay with x's. Cos negative x equals cos regular x. And secant negative x equals secant x. So there's our two even functions. Odd means f of negative x is negative f of x, and this is origin. So how do you remember origin symmetry? Just look at the letter O and the letter O, odd origin. That's how you can keep track of that. I'll talk about why we have no x axis symmetry in functions, except one very special function. So that's for odd, and that's all the rest of trig functions are odd. So we'll start with sine negative x equals negative sine x. Cosecant negative x equals negative cosecant x. Same thing with tangent and cotangent. Tangent negative x, ne uh, negative tan x. Cotangent negative x, negative cotangent x. So there's our odd functions. So why do you have no x-axis symmetry in almost all functions? Let's take a really simple function, a function that has only one point in the graph. Uh, let's say this point happens to be at 1, 1. It's a really boring function. It's just a single point. If this function has x-axis symmetry, what other point has to be on the graph? What other point needs to be on the graph if this has x-axis symmetry? One, one, negative one. Why is this not a function? Yeah, vertical line test or the one rule to be a function. Inputs, whatever your input is, gets one output, not two outputs or any other number of outputs. So if you have one point that's not on the x-axis, you will not get x-axis symmetry and be a function. So the only function with x-axis symmetry is this one, f of x equals 0. What's the graph of this function? It looks like that. Not a very exciting function. So that's the only function. That's both a function and has x-axis symmetry. 
So any function that has a point that's not on the x-axis cannot have x-axis symmetry. So this is why x-axis symmetry pretty much never shows up. It did show up when we went to polar coordinates and graphed polar functions because those are really pretty and they look like weird stuff like that. And they didn't have to pass any type of vertical line test because we were measuring in polar coordinates which sort of spin around and function very different ways.